Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, in this week's episode, we're going to look at a couple very important themes found within the prophetic testimony, the first of which is the second exodus, this concept of the second exodus. This is an incredibly important theme found throughout not just the Old Testament, but really even through the New Testament as well. Uh, And we're also going to look at the theme of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, before we jump into this Bible study, I want to make just a few brief announcements. So first of all, I know many of you are aware, but if you're not, um, my newest book, Mount Sinai in Arabia, is now available. Uh, Again, you can get it on Amazon as a soft cover. Uh, or through the uh, Amazon Kindle, if you like the ebook. Um, let me say this. I also, by the way, if you are interested in the book but you just don't have the funds, I also, I have now made all of my books available for free on my website as PDFs. So if you go to free resources and just click there, you have all kinds of uh, different translations of different books and so forth, as well as all kinds of articles. It's all free. Um, Going forward, I've decided just to step out in faith and put everything out there for free as much as possible. Obviously, I'm still selling books and DVDs and things because they cost money to print, yada, yada. And in fact, they cost a lot of money to produce. Um, I still want to make this available to those who do love books, like I love books. But by the same token, I want to get this information out there as much as possible. So with that said, the two biggest initiatives that I have right now ministry-wise. The first is we are working diligently to get the books translated into as many languages as possible. And again, I've got several books now. We have, uh, right now as we speak, we have uh, When a Jew Rules the World is being translated into Chinese. We have um, Mount Sinai being translated into a couple different languages. Mystery of Catastrophe was just translated into Spanish. We have Uh, Islamic Antichrist being translated into Spanish. We'll be moving forward to When a Jew Rules the World into Spanish. We just released the Islamic Antichrist in Swedish. Okay, so there's all kinds of translations taking place. Now, with that said, my desire is to be able to pay those that are working on these things. Some are doing it, um, some are charging, others have stepped forward and just very graciously agreed to say, hey, Joel, I believe in your message, it's really impacted me and my walk, and I want to help you translate your work. So I have some, we have some people that are doing that either free or at very, very discounted rates, but the point is this, um, by and large, to completely translate a book and then print some and actually put them out there, make them available, it's pretty cheap, um, but it's about $5,000. That's roughly what it costs per book. Now, for those that we just can't come up with the funds, again, we'll put it out there as a PDF, but we're working hard to get these into as many languages as possible. So if you are able to give, um, this is something that it's a pressing need. It's right in front of us. It would bless us tremendously. Uh, just go to my website. You click on um, Partner. Okay, at the top menu, you've got partner. And then from there, you have three different options. If you live outside of the United States, but you want to donate, you can just make an instant donation through PayPal. You can do it that way. Um, If you live in the United States and you want the tax deduction, then you click through the partner link. This takes you to I Squared Ministries, which is the ministry that I'm under. They do all of uh, my finances and so forth. And you can donate that way. And you can become a regular monthly supporter, which of course would would bless us tremendously. Now, beyond this, what I've done just recently is I minted a coin. Uh, It's a commemorative coin to commemorate the very soon opening up of Mount Sinai in Arabia. So on one side of the coin is the Joel Richardson Ministries ministry logo um, with one of my favorite verses talking about awaiting the blessed hope and talking about the return of Jesus. I mean, this is just really at the center of my message. It's at the center of the gospel, and it's at the center of my life. And on the other side is a picture. Um, It's actually a 3D relief of the split rock itself. 
uh, with a reference from Corinthians where it says that the rock actually followed them through the desert, of course not literally, but Paul says the rock represents Christ, okay, and so he's speaking actually symbolically there. But this rock itself actually represents Christ that was split for us, that was, that was broken for us, so to speak, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a really neat commemorative coin, but here's the thing is anyone who signs up to become a regular supporter, a monthly supporter, any amount, what you do is just send me an email at joel at joelstrumpet.com. So joel at joelstrumpet.com, and I'll send you two of these coins. So you can then, um, if you want, you can put them in a little shadow box, which is kind of a neat way to do it, and hang them up so you can have both sides sort of shown or with a little bit of a black velvet matting or something like that. And it's just a simple way of saying thank you for becoming a regular supporter. Um, but we do need uh, we do need more regular supporters. So th- that's really the big initiative is the foreign translations. The other one is soon we are planning on making another trip to Mount Sinai um, to begin filming. Um, the project that we've wanted to do for a long time, we're, we're getting very close to being able to do this. So this is another big push that we have. And of course, this will um, be the travel cost for actually several people uh, with the whole crew that will go. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit there, but we'll kind of leave that for another day. But for now, these are just needs that are right in front of us. I want to set this out before you. And if the Lord should uh, move on your heart if you feel led. It would blend, bless us tremendously if you uh, would consider becoming a one-time donor or a regular supporter. So thank you so much. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into this Bible study. This is, as I said at the beginning, an incredibly important uh, theme within the the story, within the prophetic testimony. So this concept of the second exodus, there's really quite a few verses, passages that we could look at, but I want to begin with Isaiah 11. This is a passage that's quoted fairly commonly, um, and in my opinion, it's misinterpreted fairly widely. Um, So let's begin with verse 1. So chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Okay, so from, you know, the, the picture is of this tree that has fallen down, it's died, it seems as though there's nothing left, but then a shoot comes out. So a shoot will spring from the the root or the the stump, if you will, of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So this thing comes forward. Now, we know this is talking about Jesus. It's talking about Yeshua. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. With righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. And righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. So you have this very clear picture of Jesus. He is the just one. He is the just judge, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's just a lot there. And then it says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. So now we're, now we're getting into messianic language. When I say messianic, I mean we're getting into language that is clearly speaking of the age of the Messiah, after Jesus is actually on the ground, on the throne, in Jerusalem, and the restoration of all things is, is affecting the, the very structure of the earth, the way that animals relate to one another. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. A child will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze together. The young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand into the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Again, so the entire uh, system of creation is no longer cursed. There's no longer animals devouring and uh, attacking one another, but they're actually even the animal, the animal kingdom is uh, all getting along. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, the point that I want to make here is that this time has not happened yet. We are not in this age yet, right? Clearly, the wolf does not lie down with the lamb. We can't even, uh, we can't even agree, you know, two out of three people can't even agree on social media. Never mind the wolf lying down with the lamb. Um, the knowledge of God will cover the earth. 
Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Now, this is fascinating because previously it referred to Jesus as the shoot, the shoot that comes up out of Jesse, right? But this is the root. Jesus is both the shoot and the root. He comes both before and after Jesse. It's a, it's a really fascinating analogy. Sometimes we miss it because you read the shoot. Oh, yeah, well, he's the one that comes forth from Jesse. And then you go, yeah, the root of Jesse. But these are two very different things. Jesus is the root of Jesse. He came before Jesse. You know, I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That sort of picture is here. It says, Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for all the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. So here you have this clear picture of Jesus. His resting place will be glorious. The entire created order is, is renewed. This is the renewal of all things, the restoration of all things. Jesus is present on the ground. And it says, then it will happen in that day, or on that day, that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, from Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath. Okay, so it's talking about a second time. What are we talking about? He will regather his people from all over the earth a second time. Not just, not like the first time, but now a second time. And from the islands of the sea, he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel. So he's regathering the exiles, the outcasts, the prisoners of Israel, and he will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. So here you have this very clear uh, picture being painted. It's of an age that's very different than the age that we live in now. And it talks about something that will happen a second time as opposed to the first time when they came up out of the land of Egypt. Now, the reason that I wanted to highlight this is because a lot of people... um, will cite this particular passage, and they'll say, See, behold, in the land of Israel, Israel has been regathered. First you had the Babylonian exile, and then the Lord brought them back. And then a second time, you had the Roman exile of 70 AD. But look, the Lord has brought them back a second time. And now they are in the, in the land, the Lord has restored them, and, you know, let's pray for revival. Okay, so this is essentially the interpretation that's very, very popular in Israel today. Just like he said, he brought them up out of Egypt, now he has brought them back again. The problem with that, and some of you will probably already already see it, is that, first of all, this passage was inspired before the Babylonian exile. So the first Babylonian exile had not taken place yet, nor had the second exile taken place yet. The only exile, if you will call it an exile, um, that had taken place was to Egypt, and then you had the exodus. And so what it's saying here is that it will happen on that day. The Lord will complete a second exodus. He will do what he did with Egypt, except now it will be from all the nations. A second time. This is not talking about the Babylonian exile. It's not talking about the present day regathering and reestablishment of the state of Israel. Rather, it's talking about something else, a great deliverance from the nations. And clearly, as part of the context of all of this, is that Jesus is on the ground, and he's in the land, and the restoration of all things has taken place. Now, clearly, the Israel, the regathering of Israel today, it's a glorious thing. It's a miracle. And it is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, but not this passage. Because clearly, Jesus is not on the ground yet. The knowledge of God does not cover the earth yet. And this passage really doesn't portray this very slow, gradual, progressive, uh, creeping messianism, so to speak. It's the Lord is going to do a mighty thing like he did back in the day of the Exodus with a mighty hand, his outstretched arm. He will deliver his people from the nations. Okay, so here you have this concept of the second Exodus. Now, this is a concept which is actually repeated multiple, multiple times throughout the Old Testament. We're not going to look at all of the passages. We're just going to look at a couple of the primary texts, okay? Isaiah references these things actually several times, but we're going to look at Jeremiah 16. So in verses 13 through 17, it says, So I will hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known. Okay, so it's talking about the chastisement of Israel in the last days. Neither you nor your fathers, and there you will serve other gods day and night, and I will grant you no favor. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought you up, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but... 
as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north, from all the countries where he banished them, for I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. Now, this is another passage which is classically applied to the current day regathering of Israel. They say, look, they came from Russia, they're coming from all over the place. Jeremiah 16 has been fulfilled. But again, although Jeremiah came sometime uh, after Isaiah, the actual Babylonian exile had not taken place yet. So he's saying it's not going to be like the first exodus, it's going to be like the second exodus. So now you could say, well, this could be talking about the Babylonian exile. Okay, but you can't then apply it to the modern-day regathering. That doesn't apply to today. This would apply to the Babylonian exile. And so the point that I want to make is the precedent that we established in Isaiah 11, which is that when it talks about a second exodus, not like it was back in Egypt, but this is going to be even greater, that's ultimately talking about the final messianic restoration of Israel to the land. There is yet coming this final messianic restoration from all the nations Israel will be regathered, but it can't happen until Jesus is on the ground and the restoration of all things is established, okay? So this is not something that's actually being fulfilled, not in the ultimate way, not with the current regathering of Israel. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 8, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Again, the context is the return of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the establishment of the king on the throne, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. That has not happened yet. Israel does not dwell in perfect security. They have not all been saved. Uh, You know, today Tel Aviv is considered to be the homosexual capital of the world. Israel is not all saved. And this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them, then they will live on their own soil. Again, the context is the messianic age, the age of Jesus, the age of the Messiah, This cannot be ultimately applied to the current day regathering in the past century, in the 20th century, the regathering of Israel. There is another final ultimate regathering that is coming, and it will be in the context of the coming of the Messiah, the return of the Messiah, the coming of God, and the restoration of Israel back to their land. They will all know him. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The lamb will lie down with the wolf, and on and on and on, right? So this is something that is not yet. So with that as the backdrop, now we're going to look at the theme of Jacob's trouble. Um, This is actually a fairly controversial topic, and I I hope that I can handle it um, with the solemnity that it deserves. Um, But it's a topic that very few people actually talk about a lot, and yet we have to. We have to talk about it because it's probably the single greatest applicational pressing relevant topics in all of Scripture that almost no one is paying attention to. Okay, so Jacob's trouble. So let's begin back in Deuteronomy 31. So this is really where the whole foundation for this concept starts, and it's at the very end of Moses' life. Now again, um, from from a perspective of hermeneutics, I'm convinced that we begin with Torah. We begin with Moses, and then the prophets are largely giving commentary on Torah, And of course, then the New Testament is often given commentary on these things previously. But we don't just begin out of the blue. As Christians who don't really understand the context of so many things in the New Testament and just sort of form a doctrine and then try to either ignore or sort of go back and twist and change previous passages, we have to begin with the foundation. And then once we understand the proper foundation, then we can rightly understand various New Testament concepts. So we begin here at the end of Moses' career, and the Lord commissions him to sing a song, a prophetic song, the Song of Moses. But the song is a profound witness and a testimony against Israel in in a really harsh way. But again, this is from the very lips of God himself through his servant Moses. So it says, it came about when Moses finished writing the words of the law, the Torah, in a book until they were complete. And it's interesting, by the way, last week we talked about the fact that Moses wrote the Torah. So it says that Moses finished writing the words in a book. 
Moses commanded the Levites, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord God, that it may re- remain there. Look at this. The purpose of Torah as a witness against you. So one of the primary purposes of Torah was to stand as a witness against Israel. Why? Because the day of the Lord is the day when every man will be found to be a liar, and only God will be exalted in that day. Every man will be humbled. Everyone will be, many will be humiliated. We will all be humbled. God alone will be the one that will be exalted in that day. The poor, the meek, the needy, those that have have. Uh, imitated Jesus in the form of being a servant, who have imitated God, who sent his very heart into the world to make himself a servant, not demanding equality with God, rather making himself a servant. Those who embrace that spirit, they will be lifted up and appointed for praise and fame in all the countries where they were formerly put to shame. They will be lifted up, okay? They will be uh, appreciated. They will be acknowledged. They will be given the well done, a good and faithful servant. But Jesus, God alone, will be exalted in that day. Every man will be shown to be a liar. Okay, so the the Torah is, it stands as a witness against the righteousness of mankind. No one is perfect. No one. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the atoning work of his shed blood on Golgotha. All of us are lawbreakers, but he paid the price. This is the whole purpose behind his, his torture and his crucifixion. So he says, it will remain there as a witness against Israel, for I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, now Moses says, while I am still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? He goes, so when I was with you, you turned to idols, and after I leave, you're going to do it again. Assemble to me all the elders of the tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth as a witness against them. For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. Again, the achachrit hayomim. For you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So Moses prophesies. Again, he hasn't even started the song yet. He goes, gather everyone together because I'm going to sing a song, a prophetic witness against you. You guys... In the last days, you're going to provoke God to anger, just like you did at the golden calf incident, just like you did throughout my life, Moses is saying, you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it in the, again, the ahachrit hayomim, the last days, the latter days, days many distant from now, you will provoke the Lord to anger. Um with the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were complete. Now, we're not going to read all of Deuteronomy 32 because that is the song of Moses. This incredibly foundationally critical prophetic chapter, the song of Moses. Now, it begins with a few positive verses about the good things that God did for Israel. And then it turns into, uh, again, an incredible rebuke. And so Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 15 through 21. Now, Jeshurun is sort of a pet name. It's a pet name for Israel. It says, But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You have grown fat, thick, and sleek. So that the, the terminology here is basically you have become self-sufficient. You've gained weight at the expense of others. That's usually the picture. Like, you've been living great, and then you became self-sufficient. You forgot me. He says, then he forsook God who made him. He scorned the rock of his salvation. So again, the song begins by extolling all of the wonderful things, the loving things, the amazing things, the provision of God, the protection of God, the miracles of the Exodus. God goes, I did all of these things. I cared for you. But then you turned away. You forsook me. And it says, and here it is again, they made him jealous with strange gods, because previously Moses just said, you will provoke me to anger. They made him jealous with strange gods, with abominations, they provoked him to anger. So he goes, you provoked me to anger in the past, again, with idolatry, with the golden calf, with various grumbling and rebellions. They sacrificed to demons who are not God, to gods that they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not fear or dread. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. 
Then the Lord saw this. He spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. So he goes, guys, you guys have provoked me so much. I'm going to spurn you. I'm going to essentially temporarily reject you as chastisement. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a perverse generation. In Matthew 24, all of this debate among the preterists who go, wait, it says that this generation will not pass away until all these things are complete. Therefore, it has to have happened in 70 AD. No, the term generation does not mean this very limited um, time frame, you know, a time window, and, and therefore it must fall within 20 years or 40 years or whatever. You would really have to stretch it out, by the way, in order for that generation to have seen all those things in 70 AD. That's a side point. It's basically, the term there is essentially this people, this race, this people of this particular spirit, of this attitude. He goes, this per, you are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. So again, this is an in-house rebuke. This is not something for some white supremacist or some anti-Semite to read on some blog and quote and say, yeah, see, Israel or you know, a bunch of this and that and the other thing. No, this is a father rebuking his children. He goes, you guys have provoked me. And remember, these rebukes always end on a positive note. They always end on a note of restoration. All of the preterists, all of the replacement theologians, the supersessionists, they always love to quote the judgment passages, but they never quote the restoration passages. They quote them, if they do quote them, they apply them to themselves, and thus they twist and pervert the testimony of Scripture. But they always end with a note of ultimate restoration. So he says, "...they have made me jealous with that which is not a god. You provoke me to anger with their idols." So. This is what the Lord says I'm going to do. I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So this is actually the passage that Paul himself is quoting in Romans 11. In fact, I believe that Paul is largely giving commentary in Romans 11 on Deuteronomy 31 and 32. When he talks about this sort of dance back and forth between, well, the Lord has partially and temporarily hardened the Jews in order that the fullness of the Gentiles can come in, and this sort of back and forth, but once the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then all Israel will be saved. And, you know, you kind of go, this is a strange dance that the Lord has ordained. Why has he done it this way? And Paul goes, hey, who can fathom the wisdom of God? And, you know, and he just breaks out into rejoicing. He goes, because when all is said and done, it's awesome. And isn't that all that matters? It's confusing, yeah. He goes, but in the end, you know, all Israel will be saved. So here Paul is, but, but here's the thing, is, is Paul quotes um, this from Deuteronomy 30, he quotes Moses, and then all these Christians quote Paul, and they go, yeah, we're supposed to provoke Israel to jealousy. And so what they think that means is they're going to wear a kippah, you know, these Gentiles are going to wear a kippah, they're going to celebrate the festivals and, you know, this sort of thing, the, the Moedim, and then the Jews are going to look and go, oh, wow, all the Goyim are actually worshiping the God of Israel. I'm so jealous. I want to do it too. Look at them. They're dancing around. they got a prayer shawl. And I'm not belittling that, okay, um, you know, if you feel led and that blesses your prayer life and, and so on and so forth, but the passage that Paul is quoting is not positive. It's not like, oh, wow, I love the messianic worship of these Gentiles. I want to follow Jesus. It's not a positive thing. It's, as Gentiles, we're called to actually, we're not called to do it on purpose, like to be jerks, but we have a ministry of provocation, which is to say that we provoke Israel to anger. Because God goes, you provoked me to anger with your idols. Here's what I'm going to do. Through a foolish people, through a bunch of stupid pagan Gentiles, I'm going to make you guys really angry. I have told the story a few times. I was coming back from Saudi Arabia. I was on the plane, and I was sitting next to this uh, Jewish gentleman, real strong New York accent. Just I could tell right away he was uh, Jewish from New York. And he asked me where I was coming from. I said, I had just come from Saudi Arabia. He said, what, did, what were you doing there? And I said, well, I actually think I was just at the real Mount Sinai. And he immediately just said, well, you know that's a complete myth. The Exodus never happened. There is no real Mount Sinai. And I said, well, are you observant? And he said, well, yeah. He said, I'm conservative. I go to synagogue. He said, but I don't believe that these things are history. I believe the Bible has a lot of important lessons, and they're very important. He says, but... German higher critical scholarship has disproven the Exodus long ago. Scholars don't believe this anymore. It's a myth. And I was like, hold on here. 
I'm the, I'm the Gentile. I am the stupid person. I'm the foolish Gentile, the foolish goy. I'm the lips of a, you know, you're hearing now from the lips of someone who is not a people. And I'm telling you that it's true. And he got really angry. And I said, listen, you're, you're, you're relying on the work of higher critical scholar, of German higher critical scholarship, which the very foundation of which was anti-Semitism. It was a project and an effort to de-Judaize the Bible to take out Jewish aspects of the Bible because of anti-Semitism. That's not true. And, you know, it became a little bit of an argument. I was being, you know, direct and, and firm. Um, but he got really upset. And I go, this is Deuteronomy 32 playing out right in front of me. The stupid Gentile is provoking you to anger, telling you that your story is true. And I said to them, I said to him that, I said, listen, I said, you're the Jew. You're supposed to be convincing me of this. You are supposed to be the light to the Gentiles, not the other way around. I'm a stupid former drug addict, and I'm telling you that your book is true, you know, and you're seeing prophecy unfolding right there, right in front of your eyes. And he, again, he got angry, and I said, all right, well, let's just agree to disagree, you know, and I said, hopefully someday you'll actually believe the words of your God and that you'll be faithful to him. So that's just a perfect example. This is our ministry. We're called to say the hard things. We're called to preach the gospel, and in that, there's a certain degree to where we are proclaiming the truth, um, even to you know many Jews that would consider themselves otherwise believers. You know, rather than just being stupid Gentiles, you know, we have been with Jesus, and we actually have some understanding of the testimony, the Jewish te- the the testimony of the Jewish scriptures. So. Um, Continuing on, skipping forward some verses later, again in Deuteronomy 32, verses 36 through 39. Now notice, I said, they all, these passages always end on a note of restoration. So incredible rebuke. Much of the whole chapter is a rebuke. It says this in verse 36, For the Lord will vindicate his people. The very same people that he just rebuked, he goes, he's going to vindicate them. And he will have compassion on his servants when, when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. And he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. So he goes, guys, now that you are completely broken, now that all your strength is gone, where are your gods now? Where are your idols now that you relied on? When you built this golden calf and you said, behold, the God that led us up out of Egypt, you know, he goes, where are they now? And the Lord loves to demonstrate the weakness and the the pathetic nature of these gods that are not gods that we give ourselves to. He goes, where are they now? They can't save you. They can't help you. Now that you're at the end of your strength, who are you going to turn to? And he says, um, where are the gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices? In other words, that which belongs rightly to God and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I, he goes, guys, listen, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. The Lord is the sovereign source of all things. It's not to say that he's the source of evil. But ultimately, he is sovereign, and all things are in his hand. He goes, I'm the one that has power over life and death. He says, I have wounded, and it is I who heal. There is none who can deliver from my hand. So in the last days, in the, again, the Chrit Hayomim, the latter days, the, the, the last days, the Lord is going to bring Israel to the end of her strength. Why? Because this is how he always does it. My beloved, don't consider it something strange when all these trials come upon you. You are being treated as children. For what father who doesn't love his children disciplines his children, right? I mean, so many passages throughout the scriptures talk about this. So many. Job says that when someone is in a heap of ruins, they stretch out their hand, and then they cry out to God. It's in brokenness that we reach out and we cry out to God always. It's when I am most desperate that I pray more than ever. Right, and it's it's how you and I came to faith. He didn't, you know, we weren't. Life wasn't just wonderful for you and I. And one day we just said, "Hey, I think I'm going to repent of all my sins and just give myself to Jesus and make Him my Lord." No, the Lord allowed us to be broken. He brought crisis into my life, and then I cried out to the God, um, the, to my Creator. I cried out to Jesus, and likewise, the Lord is going to use that same pattern because that's always the pattern that He uses to bring Israel to himself. So he says, see now that I, I am he, there is no God beside me. It's I, I'm the one that struck, I'm the one that wounded, but I'm also the one that heals. 
no one can deliver from my hand. Okay, so we have this as the backdrop. We have this clear Torah foundation from some of the most important, again, climactic final prophecies from the lips of Moses himself, that in the last days, Israel would be chastised, and then they would ultimately return to him. Jeremiah 30, verses 4 through 7, reflect this same concept. Again, the prophets are expanding upon and giving commentary on Torah. Now, these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see. If a male can give birth, the answer is no. It's interesting that in this age of perversion, of um, distorting uh, biblical reality, you know, people say, yeah, a man can give birth. No, a woman who was born a woman may take hormones and grow a beard, but she's biologically a woman. Yes, someone like that can give birth. Uh, Maybe even with some strange medical procedure, who knows what we'll be able to accomplish. But the point is this, men don't give birth. It's just very simple. It's a rhetorical question. Well, if they don't, then Jeremiah says, why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. So you have this very strong statement. He says, all of these strong men, they're gripping their stomach like they're giving birth. They're in terrible pain. Their faces have turned pale. He says, that day is great. Now, the term great is not like fantastic. It's terrible. It's the great and terrible. It's unparalleled. It's horrible. There is none like it. Okay, that is the statement of saying there's nothing comparable to it. It is unparalleled, unrivaled, unequaled. This is the worst time, the culmination of of tribulation. And then he says this, it is the time of Jacob, Israel's distress, tribulation, trouble. So here's where the term comes from, Jacob's trouble. It comes from Jeremiah 30. And then it says this, there is the the final statement of restoration, but he will be saved out of it, right? So you always have these statements of chastisement. The Lord is going to break his people in order that he can save the remnant, in order that he can save that which remains. And so here you have this incredibly important theme in Scripture, Jacob's trouble. Now, later uh, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, you have all of these descriptions in verses 21 through the close of the chapter of the Antichrist, the abomination that causes desolation, all of these terrible things that will take place. And then in chapter 12, it says this, now at that time, What time? The time of the end, the time of the great tribulation, the time of the abomination that causes desolation, the time of the Antichrist. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. And there will be, now here is, this is Gabriel the angel, Gabriel the archangel speaking. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. So it is the time of Jacob's distress. It is the time of Jacob's tribulation. Same word, time of Jacob's trouble. There will be a time of trouble such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. So here you have a commentary in Daniel on the words of Jeremiah, the words of the Lord through Jeremiah. Again, it's a time of distress, unparalleled, unrivaled, tribulation. Nothing has occurred since the time that there was a nation up until that time. It's unparalleled. And then everyone whose name is written in the book will be rescued. But Israel will be saved out of it. That's what Jeremiah says. Gabriel here says everyone's found written in the book. So again, it's a remnant. It's not everyone. It's not every last person that is a biological son of Israel, but rather those who survive, those who are names have been written in the book of life. And then it talks about the resurrection of the dead. So ultimately, the context is clear. It's, it's the return of Jesus. It's the resurrection of the dead. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life. Others, of course, this actually takes place at the end of the millennium. And oftentimes, prophetic passages do that. They kind of compress things together. But others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It's just a general statement. But those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, 
conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth over these passages. They will study these passages. They will study Daniel um, in, a, in a very concentrated way, and as a result, knowledge and understanding will increase, and it will be unsealed in the last days, and there will be a much greater understanding of the book of Daniel in the last days. Now, skipping forward a little bit, um, in verse 5 through 7, it says, I heard the man dressed in linen, this is one of the angels, who was above the waters of the river. And this angel, he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. So that's that final three and a half years before the return of Jesus. And then it says this, as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all of these events will be completed. So what is it? what did it say back in Deuteronomy 32? When he sees that their power is gone, when he brings them to the end of their strength, then he will say, where are your gods now? As soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. So the pattern is this. Just before the return of Jesus, the holy people, Israel, Judah, the whole house of Israel will be shattered. They will come to the end of their strength, and then they will be saved out of it. Then the remnant, then those who are left, then the survivors, then those whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be saved. And it's in the context of the resurrection of the dead. This has not happened yet. None of this has happened yet. Okay? And then you have Matthew 24. Now, you have the New Testament. Jesus himself actually gives commentary on the words of Gabriel, who is expanding upon the words of Jeremiah, who is playing off of the words of Moses. And Jesus said this in the Olivet Discourse, For then, he's talking about the last days, there will be a time of great tribulation. Where does the term the great tribulation come from? It comes from Matthew 24, verses 21 through 22, which is basically a translation, if you will, of the time of Jacob's distress, the time of great distress. It is great. That day is great. It's that Jesus said there will be a time of great, horrible tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So we have We've talked about the concept of the second exodus. We've talked about the concept of Jacob's trouble. Now let's talk about the last exile. When does the last exile happen? Because you can't have a second exodus without a final exile. Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 5. Behold, the day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil will be taken from you and will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, this is a passage which is talking about the current day, state of Israel. Okay? Because this is in the context of the return of Jesus. All the nations are going to gather together against Jerusalem. And it was a biblical requirement that Israel was back in the land, in Israel. Okay? So the regathering of Israel today is prophetic. But it's just not based on Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 16, Jeremiah 23, passages that are popularly um, applied to this current day regathering. However, Zechariah 14 is talking about the current day state of Israel. It says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be captured. The house is plundered. The women ravished. And half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Okay, so the Lord will come and fight against those nations. The Lord will allow Jerusalem to be trampled. He will allow the city to be uh, attacked, to be surrounded, to be taken, to be occupied. Half of the city, you know, the house is plundered, the women raped, the, so on and so forth. This is a terrible, terrible thing. But then he comes and he saves them. Okay, so it always ends on that positive note. Again, the Olivet Discourse, except this time in Luke, it says, Luke 21, verse 24, they will fall by the sword and they will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So here again, you have this cataclysmic, catastrophic, terrible series of events that happen in this final phase, the final three and a half years just before the return of Jesus. They are led captive to the surrounding nations. Okay, the final exile. 
Romans 9, 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of Israel, the children of Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. So it's only a remnant. It's only those who survive. Isaiah 4, verse 2, In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the proud, the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. So in Romans 11, when it says all Israel will be saved, it's those who are left, those who remain, the remnant, the survivors. It says in Isaiah 10, verse 20, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them. That's the Antichrist. Rather, they will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Those who have escaped. This is the type of language that is applied to those who come to faith, those who have escaped, the survivors, the remnant, those who are left. Okay, so there is a coming exile. It doesn't mean that it will be every single last person in Israel. But a time is coming when many, it says, they will fall by the sword. They will be led captive to the surrounding nations. It repeats this theme many, many times. We just looked at a few of the passages. And then finally, you have this theme of the wilderness restoration. This is a huge, huge theme, and this is a big part of my forthcoming book that I'm working on, perpetually working on. But in Revelation 12, verse 1 through 6, it says this, Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven crowns, diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. This takes place in the final period, the final three and a half years before the return of Jesus. This is Satan. Okay, this is the Antichrist, yea, Satan. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child, This is talking about Israel. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Okay, so this is a pan-historical picture. This is talking about Jesus. I know some people have tried to apply this to the rapture, into the church, and this sort of thing. It's talking about Jesus. This is actually referencing back to Isaiah when it says, we won't get into the details, but can a nation be born in a day? And then who has ever heard of such a thing? You know, who has seen such a thing before Israel um, goes through the birth pains? Before she goes through the birth pains, she gives birth. You know, who has ever seen such a thing? And it's talking about the Messiah because the understanding was the Messiah would come and bring relief from the birth pains. But he goes, no, actually the son was born before the birth pains. Who's heard of such a thing? But he comes back to deliver Israel. Um, So the child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for three and a half years. So Israel will flee into the desert, the wilderness. The word there, Aramon, Aramos in the Greek, it's desert, okay? It's it's not wilderness like a forested wilderness. It's it's, uh, the wilderness. Uh, It's the desert in in the biblical world. It's a desert. And then in verses 14 through 17, it says, But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman. Now, this is Exodus language. Okay, it says, Remember how I led you as on eagle's wings, and I carried you, and I delivered you out of Egypt from the hand of your uh, captors, and so on and so forth. So it's using Exodus language. And so the wilderness that's being spoken of here is the same wilderness as the Exodus This is what we need to understand. This is the second exodus. This is the second exile that will be completed with the second exodus, of which Jesus is the greater Moses, the Deuteronomy 18 prophet greater than Moses, Um, so that she could flee into the wilderness to her place. Okay, so she was given the wings of an eagle so she could flee there into the wilderness. What wilderness? The wilderness of the exodus. Where she was nourished again for three and a half years, time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. That's Satan, the Antichrist. The serpent poured forth water out of his mouth. This is uh, using creation language. The Lord brought order to the Tehom, to the abyss. And whenever Satan shows up, the Antichrist shows up, he's always using the language of water, the realm of Leviathan, the ocean, the abyss, this untamable. Uh, crazy thing um, that the Lord brought order to when he separated the waters above from the waters below, etc. Right? So the idea is like Satan's trying to undo the order of the Lord, undo the order of creation. He pours forth water. It says, but 
the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and drank the river, which the dragon poured forth. So the dragon was enraged, and he went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So again, here, it's clearly um, the child that's caught up is clearly not the church, because here is the church. When the dragon sees that he, he doesn't have access to Israel, the woman who is given a place of safety in the wilderness, he goes after the servants of Jesus who keep the commandments um, of God, who keep the commandments of Jesus. They hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so this, you could say, um, is the church. Now, Jer- Jeremiah 31, verses 1 through 2, it says this, At that time, when's this time again, the age of the Messiah, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people who survive the sword, again, there's the language, those who survived, found grace, where? In the wilderness. In the last days, this great exile, many will be taken captives, many will be prisoners of war. But in uh, Zechariah 14, we saw, but many will flee. Where do they flee? They flee into the wilderness. They go, it's like it's like the exodus in reverse. The persecution is so great of the Antichrist, there is a fleeing out into the desert. Hosea 1, verse 10, deals with this extensively. Hosea deals with this extensively. Yet the number of the sons of Israel, which will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are sons of the living God. In the very place where it was said, you're not my people, then it's going to be said, no, you are sons of the living God. In the next chapter, verses 14 through 16, Therefore, behold, what does the Lord say he's going to do? I will allure her, bring her into the desert, into the wilderness, and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor, or suffering, will become a door of hope. When all seems to be lost, it will turn out that I'll provide in the wilderness a place of refuge so that those who survive can turn to me when he comes back and delivers them. And she will sing there, how? As in the days of her youth, when she was a newlywed, back in the days of the Exodus, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me husband and will no longer call me master. There is the language of the Exodus, of the Sinaitic Covenant, the marriage covenant at Sinai. The Lord says he's going to renew that. When will Israel call God her husband? Ultimately, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the feast, okay? The Lord is going to throw a great feast. And then in verse 17 through 20, For behold, I will remove the names of the Baals, all the false idols from her mouth. They will be mentioned no more. In that day I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice. He's basically saying, I will marry you. Betrothal marriage is uh, subtly different, but yet uh, also very similar. In loving kindness and in compassion, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. So ultimately, you have this very clear picture of this final chastisement of Israel out into the wilderness, and then Jesus comes back as the greater Moses. Now, we're not going to get into the actual story of the return of Jesus, but I'll just say the return of, the, of Jesus, the return of the Messiah in the New Testament is completely grounded upon this concept, the concept of the second exodus, the, the second exile, the wilderness restoration, and Jesus himself will march from Sinai to Jerusalem in the procession of God, and he will deliver his people from prison. He will deliver his people who have fled. Now, in real-world application, what does this mean? Well, again, you all know that I believe the real Mount Sinai is down there in Saudi Arabia, and this is a place where they're building this massive mega city, Neom. And I know a lot of people have talked about Israel fleeing to Petra, to being there in Petra. And I believe that actually Israel will flee to this entire part of the world, everywhere from southern Jordan all the way down there into northern Saudi Arabia, because that is where the the wilderness is. That's the wilderness that they were in, and that's the wilderness where they will flee back to. I believe that whole area, that when Jesus marches up through this area, he'll be setting his people free. And it's amazing, by the way, 
to see this mega city being built that in an eschatological ultimate sense, and again, this is fairly scary, I think, to the Saudis because they're afraid that, you know, Israel wants to come and take this place over. That's not it at all. The Saudis want to open this up to the world for technology, for jobs, for all sorts of scientific advancement, to be one of the most cutting-edge scientific, um, you know, uh, technology-forward places in the world. And I think that when things really, really blow up in Israel, that this will be a very natural and easy, um, very fairly Western-friendly type of city that a lot of people will flee to to avoid the persecution of this coming invasion from the north, from Turkey and Iran and so on and so forth. And there's a um, reason why people would find refuge in Saudi Arabia, because, again, this growing reproachment uh, both economically and in terms of security with Israel and Saudi Arabia against, too, Iran. So it's amazing the degree to which geopolitically all these things are coming together and, and where they just suddenly make a lot of sense. And so this is, a re this is the reason behind, you know, I've written a lot, again, in my book, Mount Sinai in Arabia. If you, if you don't have that, get it. It's laying the foundation for some other very big, important prophetic things that I'll be laying out down the road. But um, this is the reason that I've been writing about this thing, because the prophetic pieces are really coming together in, in ways that I I've, I've, haven't really laid out clearly yet. But I want to begin sort of leaking some of this information, because it's fresh on my heart, it's burning on my heart, and I just want to get it out there. Later, I'll probably redo all of this and um, put it all together in one big, large, comprehensive class. We'll probably do it a few times. Um, but it's amazing the degree to which things are coming into alignment. And these are important concepts. Um, we need to understand the story. We need to understand what's happening, what's coming. Um, if we want to be people of discernment who are actually giving ourselves to planning and preparing for the things that are coming, we need to understand what's coming. Amen and amen. All right, friends. Well, listen, that is all the time that we have for this week. Again, remember... Um, for everyone that becomes a, a new regular supporter, send me an email at joel at joelstrumpet.com. We'll send you two of the new commemorative coins. You can also buy the coins uh, online if you want to buy one just individually or in a bundle um, with the book, uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia. They're available on our website, on the store. Um, but it would bless us tremendously if you would consider, prayerfully consider becoming a regular supporter. So again, thanks so much, and I do look forward to seeing you next week. I'm right now just about to head off to Jordan uh, tomorrow and then Israel for about a week, and so I look forward to uh, visiting with you when I get back. Lord bless you.